Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 in your Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, and of course, the memory verse, verse 17. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The title of the sermon this morning is Glory in the Lord. Okay, Glory in the Lord. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I read this chapter this week, the first time, I really struggled to know what's going on there. Uh, it, it's so challenging sometimes the way uh, things are written. I had to chew over it, you know, time and time again. You know, I took the kids to, soccer, to the soccer game on Saturday morning, and while they're playing, I'm reading the chapter as well. I'm going, what's this chapter about? You know, and it's finally sort of come together. So I hope I give you some insights as to what this chapter is about. Obviously, there are things that are simple to understand, but it's just the way sometimes Paul writes things uh, that's, that's challenging, okay? So um, if you found it challenging, don't worry, I found it a little bit challenging as well. But let's look at verse number 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Now, I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. Okay? So, the first thing I want you to pick up here is when we understand Paul, when we think of the Apostle Paul, don't we think of a very zealous man, a man that's very bold, that's very strong with his words, he doesn't compromise with his words, right? And of course, when we saw, when we read 1 Corinthians, when we saw that first letter, sure, he was very bold toward the church. He rebuked the church sharply, right? He was very clear in what he was preaching. But notice what he says about himself. He goes, in meekness and gentleness in Christ, who in presence and base among you. Paul says, look, when I'm mingling among you, when I'm with you, when I'm physically there with you, when my presence is there with you, I don't come toward you as being this bold and strong and sharp person. He says, look, I'm meek and gentle in Christ toward you who in presence am base among you. What does that mean? He goes, I'm lowly and meek among you, right? He doesn't come expecting all this praise. He doesn't come expecting all this admiration, right? He comes and is just your down-to-earth person. If you met Paul in person, he'd come across as down-to-earth, meek, mild, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, gentle, relatable to the common man, all right? But he says, look at this, about being absent and bold toward you. So in his letters, he was very bold. He was very strong. And how can we apply this today as people that are preachers, as myself as a pastor? If you ever become a pastor one day or you ever take on a leadership position in the church, you've got to be balanced like Paul was. You've got to have the boldness when it comes to preaching God's Word, right? I mean, we're not writing letters, but we're preaching the letters, the, we're preaching the epistles, right? We need to be bold, we need to be strong, we need to be clear, and if the church needs to be rebuked, we need to rebuke the church, don't we? But when we're in the presence with the people, when we're gathering with them, when we're speaking with them, when we're fellowshipping, how should we be the same way? Should, should I come to you personally and, and, and speak to you the, the way I, I preach? No, I ought to be coming to you in a mild way, in a gentle way, right? I ought to be coming to you. These are attributes of Christ, right? These are, he, was, he was a meek man, Christ was, when he was dealing with the people. But when he preached, he preached hard sayings. When he preached, he had hard preaching to the point where people were offended and left, you know, believers even left him because they were offended by the preaching of Jesus Christ. And when it came to dealing with the false prophets and the false teachers, again, Christ was very strong, okay? And when he came to the house of God, when he came to the temple, and he saw, and we can apply that to the church, right? And he saw that things weren't being handled properly. You know, the church was trying to make a profit by selling things in the church. He came out with that whip, right? And he turned the tables and he was out there you know, expressing his anger to the way they were treated in the house of God. But again, just one-on-one -on -one with Jesus Christ, he would have been that meek and lowly person, okay? These, you know, and we need to understand, this was Paul. 
right? This was Paul, and we need to understand, yes, you know, again, I talk about online preachers, right? We see how bold they are behind the pulpit. We see how strong they are, you know, and, and how zealous, and it gets you motivated, it gets you encouraged. But, you know, the righteous ones, the godly ones, in person, they're down to earth, easy to get along with, relatable to the common man, okay? And, you know, I, I think about, you know, some preachers, you know, instead of trying to get to know their church, you know, they always feel they need to have this, I don't know, this demeanor that's above everybody else when they're just dealing with, with the people, okay? And it's like they would rather hang around with their other pastor buddies because, you know, this is the elite group, you know, you know, we need to hang around the pastor buddies rather than just the everyday person in the church. That's wrong, you know, that's wrong. You know, be bold, absolutely. Be strong in your words, absolutely. But when you're dealing with the people of God, meek and lowly is the way. You know, just, just the one-on-one -on -one interaction that you have. And that's how Paul was, you know. And, and this is the, the thing about, we're, we're going to look in this chapter, is because of 1 Corinthians, because it came across so strong, he was being criticized, oh, but you're not like that in person. Well, hold on, no. I mean, in person, right, the, the right way to deal with people is to be friendly, to be meek and, and humble. All right? So, you know, a bold preacher should not become also a proud man, right? He's lowly. He should hold others, you know, highly, esteem them above, that, you know, himself. Verse number two. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, <laughs> which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. So it says to the Corinthian church, there are some still among you that are critical of me. There are some still among you that say, I walk according to the flesh. Now, obviously, when you walk according to the flesh, what are you saying? Oh, you're not being empowered by God. You haven't got the Holy Ghost empowering you. You're, you're, you're doing everything in, in the flesh. You're doing it in your own strength, right? And there were some that were critical of Paul because of his boldness, they did not see that as boldness from the Holy Ghost. They saw that as he was in the flesh, right? Um, and again, that's, that's a big misconception. You know, when you hear bold preaching, when you have strong preachers, the critic, there will always be critics out there saying, oh, they're doing it in the flesh. You know, they might very well be empowered by the Holy Ghost, Okay. So we need to understand, we, we can't just criticize everyone that's strong. We can't just criticize everyone that offends us. Because they might be being moved by the Holy Ghost as well. But he says this, at the beginning of verse number 2, that, uh, you know, that I may not be bold when I'm present with that confidence. So he goes, it may appear that when I'm with you, I'm not bold, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm present with you. He goes, wherewith I think to be bold against some. So again, these that are critical in the church that are criticizing Paul, he says, what, you think I'm meek and mild all the time? No. When I come, I'm going to have to be bold against some of you, okay, because you've been critical of me. And so we know Paul had not yet visited this church. Obviously, we know Paul was there and got this church started, got many of them saved, but he's given them plenty warning, hey, if you don't change your tune, if you continue being critical against the apostles of, of Christ, if you continue being critical against the epistles, that I'm going to come and be, same, be as bold in, in my presence to you. Okay? So if someone needs to be rebuked in the church, if someone needs to be kicked out of the church, hey, we don't do that with a meek and mild spirit. We do that with strong rebuke. We do that with boldness. Okay? Verse number three. So the, the, um, the, the, uh, the accusation was that he was doing that according to the flesh. Verse number three, he goes, for though we walk in the flesh. So he's saying, look, yeah, we, we all have the flesh. We all have this body. We all do walk in this body. We all do struggle in this flesh. Paul is saying, look, I'm not perfect. Of course I have faults. I'm a man. Yes, I have the flesh. He goes, but we do not war after the flesh. Okay? Now, to explain this, and we'll see this in verse 4 soon, what he's saying is, because of his boldness, in preaching, because of his boldness in the way he, he delivers his letters to this church, he's not warring against the flesh of man. He's not trying to, you know, obviously when there's a real war, you're fighting man against man. You're trying to destroy that army. 
You're trying to kill the opposition, right? He says, no, that's not what I'm attempting to do. I'm not trying to kill the church. I'm not trying to destroy my brethren, okay? And he goes, look, this is what we're warring against. Verse, actually, actually, let me just quickly read to you Ephesians 6.12, because it goes well with this. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, okay? You know, yes, we know there are wicked people. Yes, we know we need to be careful and mindful and protect our families and protect our church and all those things. Okay? And yes, when it comes to just the physical world, we are dealing with the flesh. We are dealing with people. But there's something behind that that we need to be understand. Okay? We're not just fighting against man. He goes in Ephesians 6.12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Look, our battle, guys, isn't just the people in some false church, but against the one, the wickedness in high places, the devil, Satan and his devils that are controlling these things, that are, that are, that are preaching the false gospels, that are, that are teaching false doctrine. This comes from the devil. Okay? We need to understand we're in a spiritual fight. Okay? We need to open our eyes, our spiritual eyes, and understand, hey, there's a spiritual war at hand. When I preach a message from the Bible, yes, it's to edify you, but it's most of all to make sure that the spiritual wickedness stays away and doesn't come in here and give us false teachings. Doesn't come in here and bring false doctrine. Okay? So, you know, it's important to be bold in your preaching, okay? You think, oh, I don't want to be bold because I might offend someone. No, we're bold because we want to strengthen the brethren. We want to fight off the, the devil and, and the attacks that he would have on this church, okay? And sometimes it might be a, a scary thing to think about, you know, do we have a target on our back by the devil? You know, is Satan trying to destroy us? Is Satan trying to destroy our ministry of door-to-door -door soul winning? You know, is Satan bringing up people to criticize our church, to criticize our preaching? Of course he is, okay? That's a reality. That's just the way it is, okay? But we shouldn't be discouraged. We shouldn't get downcast about this because look at verse number four. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Hey, the weapons God has given us are mighty. The weapons God has given us can pull down the strongholds of the devil. Amen. We have the power of God in us. You know, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You know, you're saved. You have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost in you. Hey, he is able to, to keep you safe. He is able to keep you fighting this warfare against the devil. And so if God has given us powerful weapons, and of course, that would be the Bible, wouldn't it? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, you know? And look, this is how we're going to win this war. And this is how we're not going to get discouraged and, and, uh, and, and you know, afraid of the spiritual war. Is because if we have the Word of God, okay, we read the Word of God every day of our lives. When we preach, we use a lot of Scripture. We use a lot of this this weapon that God has given us, we know the, pro the promise of God that it's powerful and we're going to be able to overcome the wicked one. Okay? So we must not become a church that, that you know, quotes one or two scriptures and then just waffles on and wastes time. You know? I, I would like to have a third service one day, but I don't want to have a third service where I'm just, you know, I don't have time to prepare a good sermon and I'm just waffling on. You know, but I'm just doing it out of tradition or something. No. You know, I want to make sure that what we preach is valuable, is, is built on the Word of God, because that's what's going to help us overcome the strongholds. Now, obviously, you know, if, if Paul is expressing this, obviously that means that the Corinthian church, and we know this from the first letter, that they had, that Satan had strongholds in the church, right? And that's why Paul had to come and rebuke them sharply. So he had to be bold and strong in his letters toward them. Not to destroy the brethren, but to help them overcome those strongholds, to kick the devil out of the church, right? Instead of him harming that church, they were able to overcome 
by the letter that came in 1 Corinthians. So again, Paul is just reinforcing, hey, I'm not trying to destroy you by being bold and strong. No, I'm trying to overcome the wicked one. So he, he flees from the church and no longer sets up those strongholds in the church. Verse number five. How else can we overcome the wicked one? How else can we uh, fight this spiritual battle? It says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts of itself against the knowledge of God. Hey, all of us have this, have an imagination. We all have a mind, right? And we might have wicked thoughts or we might live in a fairy tale, you know? Um, people come up, especially kids, and, you know, come up with stories in their mind and maybe, you know, you know they put themselves in, in, a, in an adventure with a, you know, whatever. You know, they, they've got some, some, some uh, you know, I remember doing this as a kid. You know, I, like I was some superhero coming up, you know, you know, saving the world. Hey, these are imaginations. This is just, it's ridiculous, right? And every high thing that exalts of itself against the knowledge of God. You know, that we can think about things that do not honor the Lord. We can think about, you know, we can fill our minds with this world's entertainment, which exalts itself against the knowledge of God, right? I mean, we shouldn't be watching things that promote evolution. We shouldn't be watching things that uses the Lord's name in vain. We shouldn't be entertaining ourselves with these things because it, it, it's, it's fighting, it's exalting itself against God. We shouldn't be filling our minds with this nonsense, you know? A lot of the battles happen here, guys. It's not just out there, you know, um, trying to overcome the physical sins in our lives or fighting against wicked people, wicked governments or whatever, a lot of the battles are here. A lot of the battles are being had here. And uh, that's where it's challenging. It's very hard because no one else really sees it. You know what thoughts you have. You know the wickedness that goes in your mind, right? You know the wickedness that comes out of your heart. A lot of people can't see that. And then it says, how do we overcome that? It says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It's kind of like taking prisoners of war, right? You're fighting a battle, you know, and, and they give up, and then you take them into captivity, you know, so they no longer can fight against your, 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 you know, your army, you know, your side. He says, hey, you need to bring these thoughts into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. And if you want to be obedient to Christ just in your thought life, as soon as you start thinking stupid things, wicked thoughts, you know, things that are not grounded in any truth, then you need to take that, bring it down and bring it into captivity and say, this is nonsense. I'm going to fill my mind with godly things. I'm going to fill my mind with productive things in obedience to Christ. You know, you've got to think, no, I'm not going to think of these stupid things. You know, I need to stop thinking, why am I thinking these stupid things? I need to take it into captivity. It's a hard battle to have, okay, because the mind just wanders off. I mean, it just thinks, you know, ridiculous things. Verse number six. Verse number six, and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And I covered a little bit about, if you remember, taking revenge on your own disobedience. You know, that, you know so obviously, naturally, we shouldn't be taking revenge on others that do us wrong, but we should be taking revenge on our disobedience. When we know we've sinned against the Lord, when we know we're not doing right, Hey, take revenge on yourself, right? That's part of it. Again, a lot of that is mental, and it, it, it kind of goes with what verse number six was talking about, but being ready to revenge yourself, being ready to overcome your sin in your life, disobedience, and then it goes, when your obedience is fulfilled. Hey, this is something, this is a lifelong thing in your life. You know, this is a lifelong battle that we have, even within ourselves, because he goes, when your obedience is fulfilled. At what point do you think you'll be 100% obedient to the Lord? Do you think you'll ever reach that in this life? Of course not, right? That happens once we're with the Lord, right? Rather, if we pass away or we receive our resurrected bodies, whatever comes first, that's when we're going to be fully obedient to the Lord. But until then, for your entire life, you need to take revenge on your disobedience, working toward being obedient to the Lord. Let's look at verse number 7. Again, keep in mind that uh, Paul was being criticized by some in the church here. And he says to those that are criticizing him, do ye look on things after the outward appearance? You know, they were putting a lot of emphasis on the way, you know, a preacher looked. You know, 
<coughs> and he goes, If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. Okay? So people were criticizing Paul for his outward appearance, the way he appeared in front of other people, which we saw was that meek and lowly spirit that he had, right? That gentleness that he had in person. And they were criticizing him for that, for his outward appearance. Okay? And they looked at themselves, you know, proud, boasting, high and mighty, look at me. You know, these people that had infiltrated this church or, you know, were just backslidden, whatever, and said, look, I'm better than Paul. Look at me, I'm greater. You know? And this reminds me a little bit of the stories of the Old, you know, the Old Testament kings. You know, apparently Saul, you know, he was very tall, but he was a very humble man. No one thought that Saul would be the first king of Israel. In fact, when they went, wanted to crown him, when they wanted to appoint him as king... They couldn't find him. He was afraid. He went to hide. He didn't want to take on the responsibility. And yet he was the one that God had chosen to be that first king. Or we think of David uh, that comes after him, right? David. When Saul went to the family of Jesse, when he went to look at Jesse's children, he saw all these good-looking, strong men, all these, these sons of, of Jesse. And, uh, you know, he thought, man, surely one of these will be king. But God said, no, you've got to find the little one. You've got to find the youngest one out there tending the sheep. That's the one that's going to be king. You know, even, even, even Samuel, did I say Samuel? Anyway, Samuel, you know, even Samuel, you know, was looking on the outward appearance. And, uh, you know, that, that comes naturally, right? When you're looking for strong leadership, when you're looking for strong men, you tend to look at the outward appearance. Is this someone that I want to follow? Okay? And, and I guess Paul, when you saw him in person, didn't carry that kind of perception. You know, he probably, oh, is that, is that Paul? Is that, is that the apostle that, you know, Jesus Christ chose? You know, he probably didn't look all that great on the outward appearance, right? And so what Paul does is basically causes those that are criticizing him to reevaluate. Hey, what's important? Is, is the outward appearance what's important? Because he says, if any man, verse 7, if any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, so if you're saved... If you believe you're Christ, you're in Christ, let him of himself think this again. So think about this again. Is it the outward appearance or is it the fact that you're in Christ that's important, right? That as he is in Christ, even so we are Christ's. So it's not about the outward appearance. It's not about all the works that you do and your, and your, 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 uh, your boasting and your, your pride what makes you, know, you valuable to the church, what makes you important, what the, the most important thing is that you're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you can reevaluate and say, yes, I'm in Christ. He says, look, I'm in Christ as well. So why are you puffing yourself up against me when we're both in Christ? When God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God is not a respecter of persons. So reevaluate this. And look, this is... This is what happens in churches after a while. I hope we never become like this. You know, where someone comes into the church, they don't look the part, they don't speak the part, you know, they don't know how, how to live righteously or godly, you know, and, and oh, look at that person, you know. You know, that person should dress better. Oh, that person shouldn't be saying those words. You know, why, why can't he, you know, whatever, why doesn't he know his Bible enough? People, people in churches become lofty, and proud, and they look down on new believers, right? Or they look down on just, a, just a, a, a worldly person, an unsaved person that comes into the church. Why are they here? Hey, you should be like Paul and, and, and become meek and, and, and befriend that person. If they're not saved, give them the gospel. If they're a new believer, encourage them in the Lord because we're all in Christ, are we not? If we're saved, we're all in Christ, and that's what matters, and I've seen, again, I've seen this, I've been in church, I've seen people, new believers come in, they don't know how to behave, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, hugging or, or holding hands, people looking down at that, oh, should they be doing that? You know, and they get discouraged, they don't know how to behave, no one's instructed them, they don't know what to do, and then they're out of church. They're out of church because, oh, you know, I just can't relate to these, you know, holier-than-thou people. 
You know, we, we can't be that way. And that was some of the problems that, that uh, Paul had, you know, in the church. And, uh, you know, in verse number 8, Paul kind of pulls out his authority card. You know, he kind of shows a little bit of his authority. Even though he's meek and lowly, right? Even though what's important is that we're in Christ, he says in verse number 8, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority. He goes, look, I don't boast about my apostleship, but maybe I should, right? Maybe I should pull rank a little bit here, right? Because he's an apostle of Christ, which the Lord has given us for edification and not for your destruction. I should not be ashamed. So he goes, look, if I pulled out my authority card, if I pulled rank right now against these critical people, you know, he goes, I shouldn't be ashamed of that. Because the Lord gave me this, this uh, authority. The Lord gave me this uh, apostleship that I have over the churches, right? But he goes, he doesn't do it. God didn't give it to me for destruction. God didn't give it to me to just put down people and make myself look high and mighty against other people. God did not give this authority to me to destroy the church. Do you know, to, to make the church depressed. But he gave me this authority. He gave me uh, these words to teach for edification, he says there, right? To build the church, right? And so when we preach against sin, you know, yes, it might hit home. It, you know, it might convict you. You know, you might have some sorrow and, and get a bit upset about it. But hey, it's not being preached to destroy you. It's being preached so you can overcome that sin. It's being preached so you can improve in your life and so you can be edified in the Lord and become a more mature believer. Okay? And so again, you know, I apply this to myself as the pastor because I have authority in this church. Right? I shouldn't be using my authority to just destroy you. Okay? I should be using my authority to lift you up, to edify you. Okay? That's the purpose. But again, you've got those that are boasting of themselves, that look on the outward appearance. It's almost like in order to feel better about themselves, they have to put down other people. They have to destroy other people. You know, that's the wrong, that's the wrong mindset, right? That's not how we should be as believers. Verse number 9. And verse number 9 kind of just follows the same thought there with verse number 8. Uh, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. He goes, look, I'm not trying to terrify you, <laughs> right? I'm not trying to make you be afraid of me. I don't want that. You know, I don't want you to be afraid of me. Oh, Paul's coming. Let's, you know, let's you know, hide. I'm not going to church that day because Paul's going to be there. Look, that's not my goal. I'm not trying to make you terrified of my letters, right? Um, he's not trying to speak to them with this apostleship authority and make them, oh, man, he's the apostle of God. Hey, I've gone to a few Pentecostal churches in my life. And when the, apo the, the apostle came out, it's like everyone was afraid. <laughs> it's like, oh, the apostles come in. You know, the uh, it's, uh, that's my experience anyway. <laughs> the apostles come in. That's not Paul, right? When he comes, he wants to just get along with people. He just wants to be the common man, right? He doesn't want to terrify them. <laughs> it's so opposite what you see in the charismatic churches, right? And of course, they're not real apostles, but I'm just using that as an example. Verse number 10. Verse number 10. Uh, now, for his letters say they. Okay, so verse number 10 is uh, Paul kind of paraphrasing what his critics are saying. Okay, so the say they are his critics in the church. So what the critics are saying is this. For his letters, so his epistles, are weighty and powerful. Okay, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. He goes, man, when, he's, when, when we see him, he's a weak man. And when he speaks, it's contemptible. It's like, it's not profitable, it's not valuable. We don't like the way he even speaks, right? He, he's, he's one way in his letters, but, and again, these are his critics, but in person, he's nothing. In person, he's weak. Now, I don't know if, what they mean by weak. I don't know if they're kind of mocking his meekness. Okay, meekness is not weakness. I don't know if that's, they're mocking his, his meekness or that he was just truly weak. Because if you look at, go to verse, uh, chapter 12. Hold your finger there in chapter 10. Go to chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Paul says, 
and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So it says, look, and I actually believe this is a physical illness. I know some people have different thoughts as to what this messenger might be. But it seems to me that Paul had some sort of sickness in his life. Something that kept him humble, okay? Something that the Lord allowed Satan, kind of like how the Lord allowed Satan to hurt Job, right? And the Lord had allowed this in Paul's life just to keep him humble, just so he wouldn't exalt himself above others. So I think, um, and I've heard like maybe the messenger of Satan is like um, just his critics, just people that are going around criticizing him. I think you might apply that as well, but I do think this is probably some sort of sickness he had, some sort of physical ailment he had. And so when we go back to chapter 10, verse 10, when they say in his, his bodily presence is weak, I think maybe he just wasn't a very uh, physically um, healthy or strong man. There was something about him that he was struggling with in his body. Okay? And when they say, yeah, his speech was not contemptible, they say, look, he's not a powerful or influential speaker. They're just, they're just putting him down. Right? They're just saying, hey, he, he, he projects himself one way in his letters, but when we see him in person, he's not that way at all. That's, that's the criticism that was coming that way, his way. And um, uh, verse 11, verse 11, 2 Corinthians 10, 11. Let such and one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be indeed when we are present. He goes, look, these that are criticizing me, saying I'm weak and this, they're going to they're gonna be in a rude awakening if they don't fix themselves up, right? Because, yeah, the way they, 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 they see me in word and letters is the same way when I'm present, I'm going to be like that indeed to them, okay? I'm going to speak to them in the same way that my letters, my, you know, 1 Corinthians was projected towards you, all right? So, you know, again, Paul is giving them plenty of notice, hey, Stop this criticism, or I'm going to embarrass you in front of all the church when I turn up. All right? And I, I, I like that about Paul, right? He, he gives them warning, right? He doesn't just come in and lash out. He gives them plenty of warning. Hey, you're criticizing me about being weak. I'm going to come and embarrass you. I'm going to come and rebuke you. I'm going to be strong in my words the same way I'm, I am in my letters. All right? So, you know, again, the balance, right? The balance. You know, he's meek and lowly, he's gentle, of course. Hey, but when, when it's required in person to be rebuked and called out, he was able to do that as well, okay? That shows the signs of a good leader, a strong leader, right? He's not there to destroy those that are trying to improve, hey, but he's ready to rebuke those that are critical and, and being harmful toward a church, okay? Uh, verse number 12. Um... For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. So it's, look, I'm not we, as in we, me, Titus, and the others that he had around him. They don't make themselves of the number. That, we're not like these critical people. We're not like them, right? We don't compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. So there are some in the church that commend themselves. They talk themselves up, right? Again, we're talking about these lofty, holier-than-thou people. He goes, I'm not that way. You know, I'm not there commending myself. I'm not there talking myself up, lifting myself up. What do they do? But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Hey, if you're there comparing yourself to another believer... That's not wise, okay? They are measuring themselves. They're not going to the Word of God and measuring themselves up against the Word of God. They're not going to Jesus Christ and measuring themselves up next to Jesus Christ, right? How are they comparing themselves? How are they measuring themselves? How do they think they're doing well? By comparing themselves to other men. That's the wrong approach. Okay, and uh, oh, you know, I'm so much better than that person. Reminds me of that Pharisee, you know, that went praying and said, oh, thank God I'm not like this publican. What? You should be saying, God, you know, I'm a sinner in your sight. 
You're holy and you're righteous and you're pure. Help me to be more like you. Help me to overcome my sins in my life. Help me to help my brothers in the Lord. Help me to help this publican. That's what he should be saying. But himself, he compares himself to the publican and thinks he's righteous next to God because he's better than other men. Wrong. Okay? That's not a wise man. And again, I've seen this. Happens all the time in churches. Comparing yourselves to other people. You know, I'm right with God because I'm better than that person. You know, I, when, when I was in high school, my dad was really strict on my, like, you know, getting good grades and stuff, you know, getting good examinations. And I'd come to my dad and I'd be like, uh, let's, let's, I don't know, let's say I got 70% in a, in a test or something. And in my dad, for my dad, it's like, yeah, but that's 30% that you got wrong, right? That's how my dad used to see it. And I'd be like, but dad, you know, you know, I came third in the class. And my dad's like, why are you comparing yourself to the worst people? Why are you comparing yourself to those that are getting the lowest grades? Right? You should be aiming for 100%. And that was, my, that was my dad's approach. And in some ways, he was right. Right? I shouldn't be thinking, oh, but I'm doing this, you know, like this next to my classmates. I should be going, hey, I got 30% wrong. I need to improve this. I need to make sure that I get this stuff right. Rather than going, yeah, I got 70%. You know? I should be comparing, God, I, got th- I was third in the class. No. You know? I should be comparing that myself to the standard that was being placed there. And again, as believers, we don't go around going, oh, how do I measure up next to other people in the church? No. You look at the Word of God, you look at the example that Jesus Christ left us, that's what you compare yourself to. Okay? Because then you're going to continue working toward improvement. You're going to work toward being more holy and fix things in your life, right? Because you're never going to reach perfection. You're never going to be like Jesus Christ. But if you compare yourself to another man, if you compare yourself to someone that's more of a sinner than you are, you're going to be like, well, maybe I can go a little bit this way. Maybe I can go toward them a little bit, and I'm still better than they. No, you know, you have the wrong mindset, you know? And, and Paul is saying, these unwise people, they're just comparing themselves. They're creating their own standards, you know what this reminds and I don't even have this in my notes, now this comes to my mind. Fruit inspection. Fruit inspecting Christians. Ah, oh, we don't know if you're saved until you reach a certain level, right? I don't, whatever that level is, whatever that arbitrary level is, you know, you go out, you preach the gospel, someone gets saved, they're a new believer in the church, but people are afraid to say they're saved. Oh, because we haven't seen them do the works yet. We haven't seen them reach a certain level yet. What are they doing? They're comparing themselves to man, right? Why is anybody saved? Isn't the level Jesus Christ? Isn't it perfection? Isn't that what we need to reach to be saved? And because we can't reach it, that's why we need Jesus Christ's perfection. That's why we need His righteousness. So how can you judge someone's salvation by how much they work? How can you judge someone's salvation by their own righteousness? You cannot do that. That's man comparing man. That's unwise, the Bible says. Right? The reason I know someone's saved is because they put their faith on Christ and they have the righteousness of Christ imputed upon them. That's how we know that. Otherwise, you're unwise. You're foolish if you're judging someone's salvation by their outward appearance. Okay? Uh, that just came to me now. <laughs> uh, what are we up to, guys? What verse? Verse 13. Verse 13. Uh, but we, so now he's referring to himself, not the critics, but we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. So again, you know, he measured himself to the rule that God has distributed to us, right? And I would say that's the Word of God. You know, He's doing the right thing. He measures Himself to Jesus Christ, to the Word of God. That will keep you humble. That will keep you meek and lowly because you know, man, no matter how much you compare yourself to Christ, you always know, I'm not quite there yet, right? And uh, I, I can't boast myself above other people. Verse 14, For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you, 
For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. So what he's saying there is, he's not overreaching. When he comes and, and he corrects his church, he's not outside of his measure, right? He's, when he rebukes and gives instructions to the church, it's within his measure. It's within his authority. You know, he's right to do this to the Corinthian church. And again, as the, as the church pastor, as the bishop of this church, it's within my measure to teach, to correct, to edify, to rebuke this church if I need to. Okay? It's within my measure. Okay? But it's not right for another pastor to come into this church and rebuke us because he doesn't have the authority in this church. Okay? And it's not right for me to go into another church and rebuke them, be, you know, preach against them and rebuke them because I don't have the authority in that church. That would be outside of my measure. Okay? But of course, Paul, as the apostle of Christ, Paul, who had established his church, was within the measure, was, was within his rights. You know, God had given this authority to correct and instruct the church. But not so the critics. Not so that had just turned up and said, hey, we need to change the way we're doing things. Hey, Paul is wrong. Listen to us. They were outside of their measure. They were outside of that authority, right? Um, and then he goes... For at the end of verse 14, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. He goes, look, the reason why I have authority here, not just because I'm an apostle, but I got you guys saved. I came preaching the word of God to you. You know, the reason why you have eternal life is because I, may, you know, I came out here preaching the word of God. You know, so I'm not reaching, you know, I, I'm your father in the faith, you know. Um, and so, hey, he's, he's telling the church, look, listen to me, don't listen to these critics. They're not the ones that came and did the hard work. They didn't come preaching the gospel, and they didn't come and establish the church. They've just come in thinking that, you know, they have authority, thinking they know better than what Paul knew, okay? And I hope we don't have that in our church. I hope we don't have people that come in here thinking they know better you know, they've been here for two minutes and they're telling us how the church ought to be. You know, they're not the one preaching the gospel. We don't see them going out knocking the doors, but they think they know better. They think they know what we need to do as a church. Wrong, right? Again, this is Paul just comparing himself to his critics. Verse 15. Talking about himself, he goes, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, so, again, remember, he's, he's comparing himself to the critics. So, what are his critics doing? They've come in and they're boasting of other men's labors, right? Again, Paul had established his church. Paul was helping his church grow. They were coming in, trying to change things and boasting of themselves as though they had, been, had done something in this church. As though, you know, they had entered into Paul's labors and boasted about that as though it was from them. That's a wicked thing. That's what the world does, right? The, the world boasts of things they haven't achieved. I'll, I'll give you one quick example of this. Uh, I've got so many, so many stories from my previous workplaces, but anyway. Because I had a mindset that I was serving the Lord, right, in my workplace, I made sure that the business, that I could help the business that I was working for, no matter what. It didn't matter if it profited me. You know, if I could see some improvement in other departments that had nothing to do with me, I would often tell them, I think you could do this better. No, I think you could do this. You can take it on board if you want, you know. And um, <laughs> I, I remember this one. So, you know how a lot of businesses have like, like a marketing department or a new business department. So, you know, their purpose is to generate new business, new clients, new customers, Okay. You know, retaining existing customers is one thing, but gaining new customers is also a very important part of a business, right? And so when it came to, to a, a certain department, like a marketing department, you know, I, I realized there was, there was one way that I could really, you know, improve uh, getting clients and, and people that had, had, had like looked up, looked up our business but hadn't yet made purchases. You know, I came up with a really good idea how we can improve our sales and how we can generate more customers for the business. But it had nothing to do with me or my department. 
I wasn't benefiting from the sales. I wasn't benefiting at all from, from any of that, right? I was just more concerned, hey, this can help the business. And in my mind, I'm serving the Lord, right? That's what I want to do. So I spoke to the manager in that, that area, and I gave him all my ideas. I think if he did this, 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 I think if this department worked like this and we changed the process a little bit like this, you're going to have, you know, your targets, you're going to smash your targets. And you're going to have to set new targets now because it's, it's going to be that good. And they thought about it, yeah, that sounds good. And then anyway, throughout the process, you know, week after week, they'd come to me and say, so when you said this, you know, how, how did that work? And I was like, oh, you know, this, this, you know, you talk to this person here, they're going to be able to send you this information, blah, 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 whatever it was, you know. And then by the end of it, they put it into place. Do you think they gave me credit for it? Do you think they said, Kevin came up with this idea? Of course not, right? Guess who took the credit for it? The manager, right? The person that, you know, that, that took my idea and ran with it, you know, and sought my advice all the way through. I pretty much just gave it to them, right? And they took the credit for it, right? And, um, oh man, they, and they did smash their targets. They had to set new targets because they, they, their existing targets are so simple now, so easy, it was baby, you know? And, uh, they, they, and look, I was happy because I'm serving the Lord. The Lord knows, you know, how I'm helping uh, businesses. And it was so funny because I remember when the managers had a meeting and they were talking about, wow, this, this new improvement. And, and that manager was boasting of themselves. The other managers were like, that was Kevin's idea. <laughs> but hey, I don't care. You know, the world is like this, right? The world, you know, takes the work and labors of other people and make it about themselves, to boast about themselves, because they want to lift themselves up. But it's such an ugly thing when Christians do this. It's such an ugly thing when God's people do this, right? They take the labors of other Christian men and boast about it themselves. You know, it's a wicked thing to do. It's a wicked thing. Um, let's go to verse 16. Verse 16. Oh, sorry, I didn't really finish. Let's finish verse 15. Uh, but having hope... When your faith is increased, that we should be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. So it says, look, my goal for you, my goal for being bold towards you, is that your faith would increase. That's the measure of a real Christian man, a godly man, right? The reason why he's strong and bold is he wants God's people's faith to increase. Okay? To increase. Um, not to boast for, about himself but to edify other people. And it says, if I get your faith to increase, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. So not just that your faith would increase, but that your love would increase. Your love would increase for your brethren. Your love would increase for the authority in the church. That, you know, you'd be enlarged. That's what it means. Like, you know, you'd have more love uh, for God's people. And, uh, you know, that really should be our goal. You know, when you get up behind the pulpit and preach, how can I increase, you know, the church's faith? How can I increase their love for one another rather than how can I make myself look good? You know, that's, that's the wrong attitude. Verse 16, verse 16. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. So it goes, look, once I've increased your faith, once I've increased your love toward, you know, the authority in the church or myself, now I want to go and preach the gospel to regions beyond you. Other places that we've not yet been able to get the gospel out to, that's my next goal, to get out there. I just want to fix these things in the church. Once I'm, once I'm done, we're going to continue going and preaching in other areas around you. Again, just the comparison of those self-boasters, they're not the ones doing the gospel preaching, right? But we see Paul, what's his desire? Yes, to help the church, but to get out there and do the work right? To go and preach the gospel. That's his ultimate goal, to get more people saved and establish other churches. And then verse 17, uh, but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I think now that we understand this passage, we understand why he says this, right? If we're going to boast about anything, right? If we're going to um, honor men about anything, we need to first glory in the Lord. It's the Lord that gives us these abilities, it's the Lord that gave Paul his apostleship. It's the Lord that taught him these things. It's the Lord that gave him the ability to be able to preach, write letters, and encourage churches. It's the Lord that gave him the gospel, right? It's the Lord who died for our sins, who was buried and rose again from the dead. 
right? It's the, it's the Lord that gave given us this ability to be spiritual. It's the Lord that gave us these weapons these are for spiritual battles, you know? They can pull down these strongholds. It's He that gives us the power, the ability, gives us the zeal to do the things for Him, right? We shouldn't be glorying in man. We shouldn't be boasting about ourselves. Nothing wrong with glorying, but point it to the Lord. Glory in the Lord, right? Again, I think he's just knocking down these, you know, these people that were in the church that were critical of him, right? Stop glorying about yourself. Get real. You're just a man, okay? Stop boasting about yourself. Next to Christ, you're nothing. You're only anything because you're in Christ, okay? And if you're in Christ, then glory of him. Glory of the Lord rather than of yourself. So, to me, this chapter... He's kind of rebuking these guys, but also just warning them, hey, get right, or I'm going to come and I'm going to, just like you saw me in my letters in 1 Corinthians, that's how I'm going to be towards you in person. Okay? Verse 18. For he, sorry, for not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Okay? If someone comes speaking highly of themselves, you know, I've done this, I've achieved that, you know, you know I've, um, whatever, you know, I, I think of self-ordained pastors here. Do you think the Lord has commended them? Do you think the Lord has approved of them? No, they've approved themselves, right? They've approved themselves. Not he that commended himself is approved, right? Self-ordained pastors are not approved. They're not approved by God. But whom the Lord commendeth, right? Um, I'll just finish with Matthew 23, 12. The Bible says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. But he that humble himself shall be exalted. You want God to approve of you? Do you want God to be commending you and to be exalting you and to be, um, you know, um, promoting you? Then you need to humble yourself. Like Paul was, right? That meek, lowly, humble, gentle spirit amongst the believers, friendly, you know, down to earth. That's what you need to be as a believer, right? If you can maintain that and seek to encourage other believers then guess what the Lord's going to do? He's going to exalt you. He's going to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, commend you. He's going to approve of you. But the other way is you can try to do it yourself. You can try to approve of yourself. You're going to be coming crashing down. The Lord's going to make sure you become a base, right? So, um, yeah, let's pray. Thanks, guys.